Uh, thanks, Dave, uh, for for putting this on. I think um, you know that the thing that I've learned in the last year uh, through COVID is that you know there are a lot of people from coast to coast who, who care a lot about football, uh, who care a lot about uh, learning new ideas and new concepts and and sharing those ideas with the people around them. And, and in your case, uh, really appreciate you know through you and, and through Corey uh, connecting to me and giving me an opportunity to speak to um, you know your people in Saskatchewan that, that, uh, you know, obviously uh, I can't get out there right now through, through uh, COVID, although man, I would, I love to travel right now. Um, and, and obviously uh, I think you guys are probably a little bit ahead of us in terms of return to play. And that's, that's really awesome. Uh, hopefully we all get there um, sometime this calendar year so that we can get back to the sport that we love and, and uh, you know, all, all want to talk about. So today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, offensive football, as you described, uh, oops, and my presentation is all the way at the back. Can you believe that? I didn't, I, I put it through really quickly. I beg your pardon. And I didn't, uh, there we go. And we're back. Sorry about that guys. A uh, rookie mistake. And this is not my, my rookie effort. So I apologize for that. Minimalist approach to offense, a quarterback's friend. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, if, for those that have seen uh, teams that I coach, uh, in, in the past uh, couple of years, specifically at St. Mary's in, in 2017 and, and, and the University of Toronto in 2019, we don't run a lot of concepts. Uh, we don't run a lot of formations, uh, but what we do, it's very, very specific and, and we're very specific in our instructions to our players. So we, 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 we're gonna talk about how little we do, uh, but how that we do so little gives us the opportunity to teach so much. So first, a little bit about me um, as a football player first. Uh, I was a two-time U Sports National Player of the Year, or back then when I played, it was called the CIS. Uh, if you go back even further, obviously the CIAU, uh, that's the Heck Crichton Trophy in 2002 and 2003. I was a CFL Combine in, in, invitee in the, in the spring of 2003, super fortunate to go through that process. And then I, I signed, not singed, uh, with uh, the Winnipeg, Calgary, and Toronto of the CFL and Alber, Albany of the Arena Football League. So that was a really awesome opportunity. Uh, Calgary is near and dear to my heart. And uh, Matt Dunnigan was my head coach and general manager and a good friend of mine now, and, and obviously still stay connected with him. Um, so, you know, that is, it's something that I've, I've taken from that. But obviously just getting the chance to be in, in training camp with Winnipeg, Calgary, and Toronto in the CFL was, was super awesome. Um, got the chance to learn from obviously Matt, uh, Kent Austin, who was, you know, obviously from Saskatchewan in terms of his CFL days uh, and having the chance to play for him uh, with the Toronto Argos in, in 2005 uh, and Ron Lancaster Jr. with, uh, you know, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in 2004. Uh, you know, throughout the course of, uh, of my coaching career, uh, I've been all over uh, Canada. I, I, I worked in, in British Columbia uh, in 2007, 8 and 9, or I guess 8 and 9 really when I coached there. Uh, with the Victoria Rebels, where I got to know Corey Goff, who's responsible for helping me be a part of today's uh, uh, event. So I uh, got a chance to know Corey there and coach the Victoria Rebels. And, and that was in the early stages of what we run into, what, what I call numbers and leverage uh, for how we run our offense. I actually got my start, which is really funny, at York University in 2005, where I was actually the offensive coordinator in 2006. And I did really horribly. So that's uh, something that's fun to talk about sometimes. Uh, but I was just a really, really young kid trying to find his way. And I recognized that there needed to be a better way than what uh, I was able to present. And, and that was what I'd learned. Uh, and, you know, I think we need, you know, in that situation, you just needed the best players all the time. And, you know, it was frustrating to find like when we played against better teams, uh, it was very difficult to win. So that uh, set me on my path to, let's say, reimagine offense and reimagine football. And we're going to talk about uh, what I came back with uh, in 2017 at St. Mary's University where I was a part of a coaching staff that uh, came off of a two and six season the year before I got there. And uh, we became a six and two football team. Uh, we led the offense in, in every statistical category, even in rushing, when you look at yards per carry. Um, obviously our yards per game was not uh, in the top uh, two there. I think we were third overall, but in terms of yards per carry, we were number one. Uh, we took the 23rd ranked offense and we became, I think 23rd, and we became the number nine ranked offense in the country. Uh, and obviously uh, played in the Loney Bowl and lost in double overtime with over 500 yards of offense. In 2019, I think it was uh, maybe even more impressive, the turnaround that we were a part of at the University of Toronto, uh, where we took over the number 25th ranked offense uh, and didn't have any new real players 
that we were able to add in terms of recruiting. So we were able to go into the, the season with the same uh, players that they had the year before. Uh, and we got the number seven ranked offense in the country um, and the number one passing offense in the country. We had the number one quarterback in terms of yards, touchdown passes, and completions. Uh, his name's Clay Sequeira. Uh, and we had the number one and number two receivers in the country, uh, Will Corby and Nolan Lovegrove, in terms of yards and touchdown catches where they were tied for number one. So, you know, when you look at it, you can sit there and say, well, is it, is it luck? Is it how do you always get these opportunities to turn around? Well, I think I'm lucky one that I get to go to some programs that haven't had uh, a, a lot of expectations. So from that perspective, there was going to be a significant turnaround with, you know, uh, just from the fact that I wasn't taking over the number 10 team and, and going to number seven or six wouldn't have been as impressive. But um, no, it's not luck. We, we use a lot of data and analytics, and we're going to talk about that today in order to, you know, um, give our kids a competitive advantage. And we talk about that a lot. So with that, let's, let's get at it. So if I showed you this first slide, it's literally my favorite slide of any presentation I've ever given. And we talk, and, and a lot, I know a lot of you guys teach um, high school age uh, players, maybe a little younger in some cases, and I know uh, there may be a university or a coach or two on, on the, on the uh, call. Uh, but when you look at these four questions, there's literature questions, there's math questions, there's um, uh, geogra geography questions and, and a physics question. And I think when you look at it, um, if I presented this to a student athlete and said, okay, you have a test and I'm not gonna tell you the information and there could be questions from anywhere on there. Um, and we're gonna prepare for absolutely everything. Uh, our student athletes wouldn't do very well. Uh, and, and as coaches, sometimes like that's what, that's what a lot of, of us do, right? Or did in some cases, uh, I, I don't do that anymore because I don't see the value in it. Like we can't, provide, we can't, we can't uh, have a play for every single possible scenario. But what we can do is try and give our kids the tools in a, a minimalist situation um, to uh, be successful and to tack with numbers and leverage. And we're gonna talk about that today. So this is kind of what we think reality is, is that we have to prepare for everything. Uh, this is the funny part, this is actual reality. So these are four consecutive plays uh, that I was at the University of Toronto against Queens. Um, we lined up in the same formation and they lined up in defense. And if you notice, literally, other than the fact that uh, it's at a different line and a different, or no, a different yard line and a slightly different angle, you would think that this is the same picture. So we've got four consecutive plays with four different down and distances that the defense is lined up with the same coverage contour and the same, you know, the same shell, so to speak. So if they're gonna do the same thing and maybe they blitz a different backer, and to me, that doesn't change the integrity of the defense. If they're going to do the same thing, why can't we do the same thing? And for those keeping track at home, uh, we ran hitches against this team 41 times out of the 73 plays that we run in that game. Uh, just so that we know, I went to Queens, as I said. I don't want to pick on my former school. So I'll, I'll pick another school uh, as well, uh, Laurier. Uh, again, four consecutive plays uh, at, against Laurier uh, with the University of Toronto uh, in 2019 when I was coaching. And again, if you didn't know that these were four different plays, you would think that they're running the same defense and pretty much they did, right? So the exact same shell again, and basically the integrity of the defense stayed the same. So once again, I asked the same question. If they're going to run basically the same defense consecutively, uh, obviously maybe adding a blitzer or two, why do I have to consistently run different plays to attack them? And the answer is I don't. Um, and just to show that I'm not picking on just Queens or just Laurier and the OUA, this is the SEC, right? And this is a level of football that I think uh, if we're being honest with ourselves, in most cases, we would all aspire to coach uh, at this level, right? And so here, once again, we get four consecutive plays of Texas A&M, and I think this is the 2016 season, uh, but I just put up four consecutive spread offense plays against Auburn, and you can see Auburn, once again, uh, the integrity of the defense doesn't change. So our reality is much different than the reality that we're presenting our kids with. And I think in some cases, it's because us as coaches want to give answers and, um, and, and have ideas for them. And in some cases, we see something really cool on TV and we're like, can we do that too? Um, and, you know, listen, it's great to be innovative. It's great to be fun. Uh, I believe we're innovative. And in, inside of our innovation, we're simple. Um, and again, I think if you ask defensive coaches, uh, they would recognize that we're pretty simple. But I think at the beginning of their uh, um, investigation into who we are, they wouldn't think we're so simple. It's upon further investigation when you dig deeper to realize we're only running X amount of plays and you know, you'll see how many in a few minutes um, that, that we're really not doing that much, but we are 
um, giving our kids significant tools inside of those plays. So we're data driven and I'm gonna show you the success that we've had. So it's because it's one thing to say, hey, we've turned around programs or we've been more successful. Um, but this I think tells a slightly different story. So this is 2016 St. Mary's versus 2017 St. Mary's. And you can see anything that is green is positive. It means we grew. And you can see there's significant growth in certain cases. So before uh, we got there in 2016, they scored 126 points. We scored 247 with the same players. Uh, we did add a quarterback, but I would say many people before that person, uh, Caleb Scott had got there, would have thought that it wasn't uh, uh, an increase in talent. It was Brock Berglund, who was a, a three-star ESPN recruit uh, who scholarship at the University of Kansas that was there before Caleb Scott. Caleb Scott was a Division II player uh, who played at Huron Heights in, in Ontario before he went down. So again, similar athletes, uh, change of system, change of, uh, in terms of attacking with a competitive advantage. And you can see they went from scoring 15.8 points per game and we scored 30.9. And across the board, we improved in every single category um, and, and significant growth. Um, you can see we went from four passing touchdowns to 10, uh, even our rushing, um, situation was we went from 5.2 yards per carry to 6.2 yards per carry. Now, I want to be honest about it. Most people wouldn't think about me and think about rushing offenses, but we were fourth in the country in yards per carry at St. Mary's University, uh, which is pretty wild. Uh, fast forward to uh, 2018 and 2019 in comparative analysis of the University of Toronto uh, before and after we arrived. So again, very similar. Uh, in terms of yards or points per game, uh, they scored 122 points per game. And once again, instead of 227 this time, I think it was 125 and uh, 227. This time it's 122 and 222. So again, 182% uh, return on that. Points per game went from 15.3 to 27.8. So again, a, a major, major increase. And you can see there's only two categories that we didn't do better in. One was rushing attempts. We ran, we went from rushing 153 times to 133. And rushing touchdowns, we went from five to one, but we did throw 24 touchdowns at the University of Toronto. But once again, we were high in terms of rushing yards per attempt, whereas at, Toronto, at St. Mary's, we were 6.2 yards per carry. At Toronto, we went from 4.5 to six. So a huge growth of 133% and good enough for seventh in the country in terms of yards per carry. All that said, um, you know, we had to recognize that there's certain requirements or certain restraints that we're under. So here's the challenges that we face. First is the weeks are not that long, right? We only have three real practices uh, at the university level. We have a walkthrough practice before that, and we have a walkthrough practice at the end of it. So in between those two walkthrough practices, we have, you know, kind of, we've wedged in three real practices that are pretty, pretty dynamic. Uh, in many cases, uh, you know, film sessions that are happening with our players that aren't, you know, like if we give film access to our players and we ask them to watch film, we're not going to be there for it. So we had to find ways to be more productive with film study. And we'll talk about that. Uh, you know, one of the things that you'll, you'll see from us is we don't run five different variations of the same play. For the most part, we run one concept of each play. So if we run smash, like we don't run smash to three, two, one. We don't, you know, rub with smash. We don't run, you know, um, double move smash. Like we just, we run smash. You'll see it. We'll talk about it today. Um, because it's not easy to master one variation of a concept. All of a sudden now we're changing, you know, the, the dynamic for the quarterback. We're changing what his eyes look like. We're asking the receivers to memorize multiple uh, releases or concepts. And the reality is if, if they're not understanding what release to take, that can kill them from the get-go. So we want to make sure that we're right on every release. We want to make sure that our, our quarterbacks are always making the right decision. Because if they're not, we have no chance of success. So we'll run less so that we're always in a good situation with our players. They know what they're doing. They're attacking the right place. They're attacking with the right release. And we'll talk about some of those releases today. And then also understanding that there is no magic formula. At some point, this is always going to come down to execution. So we want to give our kids the best chance at execution that they possibly have. So what does a week look like for us? So this is literally a game plan that we went into um, last year in a, in a specific game. And this is all we ran. So. Uh, you can see that we ran uh, three formations, 31, 23, and 33. Those are, I would say, the three most predominant formations that we run. You'll probably notice that there's two missing there, and they're the two most popular in the country. The first one is 32 and 22. Uh, we don't run them. They don't supply a competitive advantage. That's not hyperbole. That's fact. Um, if I was in 32 and you rolled your free safety to the field, which you would do, 
and played weak cut, which would be the smartest thing to do. You would call that match. We would be outnumbered everywhere. In addition to that, your will linebacker would be a an edge of the box player to the boundary, and he'd be able to be in the box and also within two steps, uh, get underneath the number two receiver. So he is able to triangle off to the boundary and create a three on two advantage for the defense. You have a four on three advantage to the field uh, and in the box, it's six on six where we do not win. So we're losing everywhere from an offensive perspective. So we had to make sure that we attacked with a competitive advantage on every single snap. We identified that unless you blitz out of that 32 set, we won't have a competitive advantage and we want to control the advantage at all times. So if you put us in a situation where we can't control the advantage or may not even have an advantage, we're not interested. Um, so with that said, we run 31, 23, and 33. And those formations guarantee that no matter what you do, you're going to give up a field zone. Now, you're going to get to choose what field zone you give up as a defensive coach, but you have to give one up, okay? And for us, that means having even numbers in the pass game. So which, what I just said is we don't want to be two on three, and we don't want to be three on four. We want to be three on three, two on two, one on one, or four on four. If we can't have it, we're not throwing the ball. And people would say, well, coach, you throw the ball so much in Toronto. That can't be the case. Well, actually it was. Uh, no matter how much we threw the ball, people cons consistently continued to give us either the field or the boundary. Uh, and we don't want to and won't run the ball unless you give us numbers to the box. Uh, what that means is we have to have a plus one situation for us. So if we're running the ball with six, that means the five uh, O linemen and a running back, uh, then we, count, we need you to have a five man box against us to guarantee a run. Uh, if we have seven, so we had an H back in, we would need you to have six or less. That said, it doesn't mean that we won't call a run. We are a huge RPO team. Uh, for those that have seen our film, uh, we run RPO probably more than anybody in the country. Uh, it so happened that we run it out of formations that we guarantee pass a lot. Not because I like to throw the ball that much, but because we were deficient at offensive line at the University of Toronto, and we were deficient at the offensive line at St. Mary's University. Uh, for the first time now, I have a group at York um, that I would say has probably the most talent yet. Now, listen, the Toronto group, the same areas group, they worked very, very hard and they took advantage of the, of the talent that they had and they did an outstanding job for us. Very proud of their efforts. In some cases, they were young and in some cases, they were inexperienced and we were trying to gain uh, experience with them. But yeah, we, you know, we, we just take advantage and we'll look at running RPOs in most situations. So we can run two back RPOs, we can run one back RPOs. And without getting into it, because this isn't going to be an RPO presentation, although if you are looking for an RPO presentation, there are places online. If you Google my name, you can find one on that and, and see how we run them. But basically what I can tell you about the RPO situation is that if they have a plus one situation on us in the box, we're going to be RPOing a box defender, which means it's likely that we're going to be pulling unless he hard pulls out of the box to try and get underneath and sinks underneath one of the two uh, row uh, sides, either the field or the boundary. Plus, if we have a plus one situation, we're going to be we're going to be uh, RPOing a third level defender in that particular case. So it's likely that we hand the ball off unless, of course, that third level defender adds into the box late. Getting back to what we run in any given week, though, this is this is a ready list for us. Now, this isn't how I present it to our team, but at least it's broken down for you guys to see. And you can understand uh, why we run so few plays. So, for instance, um, if you look at, you know, we had three runs in this week inside and outside zone and draw. We had hook, smash, over, under, flood, verts, and post wheel, uh, which is basically, um, you know, if you watch us play, that is what we run. But we had shovel, tailback screen, hit screen, bubble screen, and tunnel screen in the pass game. Altogether, 13 plays. When you think about it, that we had them, for the most part, out of all three formations, and uh, we could run them on both hash marks, you factor in that we, we can, if we run each play twice, we have 156 plays run. So I want you to think that. 13 plays, three formations, either hash mark, run them twice, you've run 156 plays. If we run 15 plays in Skelly, 12 in inside run, and 15 in team, that's 47 in a practice. Multiply that by three, you have 126. So with only 13 plays, we're only able to run each of them twice in a week, and then a couple extra, we'd be able to run a third time. So if you go into a play game with 56 plays and you have three practices, I wonder how many times you're practicing each play. How, how good, how, how well adjusted are your players going to be to those concepts? Um, and, and again, like how comfortable and how confident are you going to be in running them? And if you don't practice three times for those who are high school coaches, or if you have a summer ball out there, I know high school probably does practice three times, but summer ball, if you do have it, or if you're from another province, you may not, you may have it there. You might only be practicing twice. So you, you know, you can reduce that by 47 reps. 
So we need to make sure that our, our student athletes and our players are, pre are prepared for everything that they face and at least giving them uh, two reps of film of each concept, whether they're taking that rep or they're watching that rep visually from behind. And then of course on film later uh, gives us an opportunity uh, to be successful. So when we look at things, we needed to look at, you know, first of all, um, you know, we needed to take a focused approach to what we were doing and celebrate successes. So we had to look at like, how do we evaluate our players? Obviously film study is important. We mark up film study for people to take home now. This is something that's evolved over the last couple of years, something I did more at Toronto and something I continue to do at York. Our new software platform we use, Just Play, allows us to mark it up and actually uh, put film right beside the play in the playbook. Anything that changes, we're able to move in and out. In addition to that Just Play playbook uh, uh, creator, we also have the opportunity to do quizzes and, and force timelines on them. So not only timelines in terms of how long they have to take the quiz, but also how long they have to answer each question, which is really effective for quarterbacks. But we give them to all of our players, regardless of position, so that we understand like what are they actually retaining and where are their blind spots in terms of uh, retaining information. Because sometimes we just get them on the field and we see them bust and we don't even know that they didn't know, right? So if we could at least understand what they know before they do it, we're gonna be in a much better situation to watch them and help them succeed on the field. Uh, we also recognize that we need to align our plays with our drills and in and, and an effort, one, to save our players' legs, but also to make sure that we're maximizing our practice time. Our time for Indy, like Indy as we've known it in the past, is in the off season. Our Indy that we use in uh, in-season stuff would be uh, uh, reps that we would have a tangible uh, opportunity to, to, to align with our plays. So we're not just like running a, um, you know, a, 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 a ladder drill or anything like that. We're, we're doing RPO drill, which you'll see today. We're running two on one fast break drill. We're doing a lot of drills that are interactive amongst multiple pl uh, players inside of different groups. Uh, and then we need to attack with a competitive advantage on every single play. Now, obviously, look, we're gonna be wrong and there's gonna be different factors for why we could be wrong. Uh, one of those factors could be obviously me as a coach, I might. Uh, not give the right idea or concept to a quarterback. Now, uh, I can take more or less control based on the quarterback that I have. I've had quarterbacks with, I've, I've been able to give significant control to. And I've had quarterbacks with whom I've had to uh, really, really support through the process. My current quarterbacks at, uh, at York, I can, I can tell you, like yesterday we had a meeting, they led the meeting, I probably said five words in the meeting. And that was an offensive meeting, right? Uh, with our offensive line. Uh, so a, a group of quarterbacks broke off with them, led based on protection, um, uh, on RPOs. We talk about who we block, who we don't block. We have terms for all that. Our quarterbacks are responsible for managing all that information at the line of scrimmage. We also let them call plays. Uh, and inside of that, we're not just saying, here's an entire playbook, call whatever you want. We're saying inside of the world of numbers and leverage, inside of the formation that we call out to you, you have the ability now to attack the appropriate field zone with a small subset of plays with which you feel most comfortable with. So they may have three or four options in any field zone. And really, I don't care what play inside of that subset that they use. For the most part, every now and then there may be an override and we'll, we'll have something for that. But if they're able and they're comfortable and they're capable, they'll be responsible for calling plays. I really take a consultative approach on game day from that perspective. Uh, we talked about the tests that you'll see. Uh, these are tests that we use inside of our Just Play. I just did a quick uh, copy and paste. Uh, this was from back. Uh, I copied it today, but it was from back in April when we first started. So I just grabbed the first five that we did. And you can see, obviously, uh, uh, how many points the test is worth, what the average score was. So we can see this is for all of our quarterbacks. You can see how many people took each test. So you can see 28 receivers took a test uh, on April the 9th. Their average score was 82%. Okay. Um, you can see, obviously, our quarterbacks. Um, in the spring, we had we had five in camp. We have uh, six or seven right now, uh, including our, our uh, new recruits. Uh, but you can see that their test scores are between 78 and 88%. Some of these questions are very, very difficult, right? And not difficult in the sense of uh, like nothing is that difficult because otherwise we wouldn't run it. Uh, but the time constraints that they're under make it a lot more challenging. Uh, from there, I have, in this particular case, uh, avoided out their names just so nobody can see who they are. But this is one specific test where four of them wrote it and you can see their individual scores. And I can actually break it down. If I view the breakdown, if I were to click on one of those and we were actually in the system, 
I would actually see their test and which questions they got wrong. So I know not just by quarterbacks, but on any position within 15 minutes of administering the work uh, or after they've watched film, I can have them write a, qu a quiz and understand what level of information they retained so that we can gear our next meeting to the information that that specific person may need if, or if we're in a one-on-one -on -one situation, talking to them directly about the mistakes that you know, they weren't aware of on film and then are aware of on the quiz. And then obviously the film in that particular case, uh, you know, is going to support that, you know, uh, when we watch it together, hopefully that they don't make the same mistakes uh, when we watch it. Getting back to numbers and leverage, why it's so important, why attacking with a competitive advantage is so important. For anybody who's seen any of my presentations, almost every one of my presentations has a slide that looks something like this, uh, depending on where we're at in the process. So. What does red mean? What does green mean? What does blue mean? So red means in formations where teams attack without a competitive advantage. So when I talked about attacking with three receivers, that meant they threw into four or more receivers. Or if they were throwing with two, it means three or more. You get the idea, one, two or more. Um, the green situation means attacking with a competitive advantage. So that means if you're running the football, you're plus one, seven on six, six on five, uh, and if you're throwing the football, it means even numbers. So four on four, three on three, two on two, one on one. To be clear, the red also means that if you're running the football, they have as many people in the box as you have running. And obviously that means plus one for them because one of your guys is going to be the ball carrier. We don't count the quarterback in the count unless the quarterback is the specific ball carrier on that attempt. And if he's specifically the ball carrier by, um, by their commitment to him being the ball carrier and it by by let's say running a draw, as opposed to the quarterback scrambling. The blue area is what happens when you mesh the two areas together. Uh, and that's meshed together by the percentage of which, it's weighted by the percentage of which uh, they actually ran um, those, for, uh, those formations in those plays. So what this means, obviously I've blacked out to, to uh, I've blacked out the teams in our conference. So this is all OUA teams, for the exception of St. Mary's obviously when I was there. I've blacked out all the other teams uh, because obviously I, I want to protect them. They're not here on the call to defend themselves and they don't even know we're talking about numbers and leverage. So I don't think it's fair to show who's who. What I will say is though, everybody's represented. Uh, that said, you can see, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll walk you through what this means. So when teams attack without a competitive advantage, they average 4.7 yards per play, 4.69. Uh, when they attack with a competitive advantage and you factor everybody in, they average 10.13 yards per play, almost five yards per play more. It's wild, right? Um, and you can see we're no different, right? So at St. Mary's, we averaged 4.14 yards per play and 2.81 at Toronto, which would speak directly to, and this is without saying, hey, you know, we're not as athletic or we're more athletic. Uh, I, can, I can tell you right now that the teams on this spreadsheet, uh, if you wanted to guess who they were based on how athletic they were, uh, all you have to do is line them up based on how many yards per play they get uh, it, when they're not attacking with the field uh, appropriate field zone or when they are, and just align them that way. The higher their numbers are inside the respective field zone, uh, the more athletic they are. So you can see, uh, and, and, and again, there could be some statistical anomalies. So for numbers that are way out there, like this one right here, 19.82, you can see they only attack with a competitive advantage 14% of the time. There might only be three games in there. That might mean that there are only 18 or 20 plays where they attacked with a competitive advantage in three games. That's incredible. Um, so let's walk through what all this means. So first of all, you can see at the University of Toronto, uh, we attacked, so we'll go St. Mary's first. We attacked in St. Mary's with a competitive advantage 79.89% of the time, okay? And inside of that, we averaged 8.46 yards per play. You can see our averages when we compare them against all the other teams that we played against or played against in the OUA, our numbers are lower in both places. Um, our numbers are also lower in both places when we attack without a competitive advantage. The blue total over here though, tells you exactly how many yards you average when you combine the two. So what your actual average is. And in those games, we were number two and number three respectively. Uh, even though we were last when we attacked with a competitive advantage, last, almost last when we attacked without a competitive advantage, but we were second and third when we attacked overall, because we're always putting our plays in the bucket of competitive advantage. Okay, so when we look at it, you can see we attacked at Toronto, I say Mary's with a competitive advantage almost 80% of the time, at Toronto, 68% of the time. And you could say, well, coach, does that mean you're getting worse at your own concept? No. The reason why we attacked less at the University of Toronto with a competitive advantage 
is because we were trailing in games more in the fourth quarter. And, you know, listen, I, I believe in numbers and leverage. It's the only way. But when there's a minute and a half to go in a game and we're down 10 points, we're getting to the end zone as quickly as we possible because we're going to lose if we just score once. So at that point, yes, we're going to do everything that we can to score. Had we done that earlier, we would have been way behind and it wouldn't even have been a competitive game. So at Toronto, we were, we were trailing more than we were at St. Mary's, unfortunately. Uh, but in situations where you don't factor that in, we were actually 84% at Toronto. So, but I'm not going to give you guys fake numbers. I'm only going to give you the real stuff. So that's why, and that's, and again, when you compare that to our competitors, uh, our competitors attacked anywhere from 14, 18, 28, 27, 16, 15, 18, 23, 8, and 16% of competitive advantage in terms of their games. So we're really, really proud. We're, we're tripling almost the nearest team. And again, the nearest team might just be a team uh, who also was relying on pass game uh, because they were down, right? So in, in situations where uh, there was nobody that I identified as somebody who was trying to do this. Thing. That's what I'm, I guess I'm getting at in this particular case. It's not just yards per play that goes up when you do this though. It's everything. So T2T -T is time to throw. When you're attacking without a competitive advantage, the quarterback is holding the ball across all teams for 2.45 seconds. Uh, when you're attacking with the competitive advantage, 2.04 seconds. So you're saving almost a full half of a second. Why? Because there's no second window throws. There's no second window to get to because they're not plus wanting us in coverage. When you attack without a competitive advantage, you complete across all teams, 52.3% of the passes that you make. With a competitive advantage, 73%. So you're increasing your percentage by 20%. These are tangible numbers. When you attack without a competitive advantage, you attack and, 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 and throw interceptions in 2.67% of your passes with a competitive advantage, all the way down to 0.85% of your passes uh, turn into interceptions. So you're, you're de decreasing your interception rate by two full percentage points. It's incredible. In addition to that, I'll slide through this one because I'm probably gonna go way over if I don't. I've got lots of film and, and scheme to get to. But basically what this just shows is no matter what the field zone, okay, no matter what the field zone, whether it's field box or boundary, no matter what team it was, when they attacked with a competitive advantage, they always got more yards per play and it was always significant. I'll hold it up here for another five seconds before I, before I go on. I know this is being recorded, so it's a chance you can pause it here if you need to. So one of the things we talked about is we need to tie in our rope combinations with our drills. We need to tie our plays to our drills. So this is a drill that we will run and it's gonna tie in with three of the next four rope combinations that we, we show, the plays that we show here. And, and we'll actually show some film of those plays as well. So the first one is we'll throw tail enders a lot. We throw tail enders a lot because we wanna save our players legs. Uh, just like we use data and analytics towards offense, uh, certainly uh, football, I would say at York University, we also use that in analytics, uh, our, our strength and conditioning coach, Coach Sam Miles Frame, she's amazing. Uh, she uses that in analytics and is, is cutting edge in terms of understanding how much we're running our, our student athletes. And she wants to make sure our athletes are ready for Saturday. So in a lot of cases, that means, you know, tracking how much running they're doing in practice so that uh, we can make sure that we're ready to run and, and, and not be, uh, you know, hampered by not being at 100% on Saturday. So we run a lot of tail enders where we can. Not in Skelly, not in team, obviously, we're running full drills. But when we get to Indy and we're running drills like this, we cut it down to the tail ender. So you'll see, we'll run the tail ender of smash. So we'll just give our number three receiver and our number one receiver out here. So the boundary quarterback will be throwing smash where he's reading off one defender. Now, obviously, in this drill, this would be our own receivers uh, or potentially running backs playing corner, depending on how, uh, so, you know, how inclusive this drill is. Usually, it's just going to be a receiver because running backs will be off doing a different drill. Uh, then we can run over under. So again, we take our num a number three receivers and our number two receivers, and we'll run the stack and the over under, which you'll see in a few mo moments. So we'll have a linebacker who's splitting the difference between the two, and we're stretching that linebacker with that. And then all the way to the right hash, we can run in this particular case. And again, it could be right or left, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can choose where the drills go, but uh, obviously we'll run flood in this side uh, right now. So as you can see, we'll be stretching the two week defender or the boundary half here in Canada. Uh, I've done some presentations in the States and it's just easier now to write two week instead of uh, boundary half because I don't know what that means. So in this case here, we'll read off the two week defender. If he sinks, we're throwing the quick out right now at two to four yards. And if he jumps down, we're throwing the deep out. This has done a great job for our quarterbacks in terms of make, getting more and more reps, but at the same time, um, also 
uh, you know, saving our receivers' legs. So those are three concepts that we run a lot of. Uh, the first is, and, and again, it's the one that uh, was on the left-hand side of the screen, is smash. So these are our rules for smash. Uh, as you saw back there, we only run five plays. I'm going to present four of them to you today. Um, and, you know, and, and again, it's not to say that we might not run a six that we, we game plan and we put in for a specific week, but we don't go off the rails and start putting in nine or 10 plays for a team. Uh, it just doesn't happen, right? Our guys would, you know, would be uh, not well served by doing that, we believe. So the, the, let's go through the details of Smash and then we'll watch the concept. As you can see on the left there, uh, that's how the play looks. Uh, you obviously see there's an option road from two, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we have a deep corner and two hitches that end up being at six yards. So let's let's uh, let's talk about the rep and the road in depth. Uh, the quarterback is taking a gun and three drop. So he's he's catching it and dropping three and and looking to throw on time and then pattering his feet at the top of the drop. The outside receiver, the outside, the number three receiver is going to take an outside release on the number three defender. It's really really important, and you're going to see us today talking about restacking. So we're not just going to take an outside release and go to the corner because then we drift uh, and we allow the corner to get back on the play. You're going to see our guys on film get an outside release, then get back on top, restack them, and force a two-way go on the number three defender. Make him believe you're just running right by him, running a seam. So he turns into chase, and now we can throw the ball skinny, we can throw the ball flat, whatever the quarterback has time for uh, and feels is best uh, serving him. The number two and the number one receivers are both going to run hitch routes. Uh, uh, at six yards. So just a six yard hitch, they're not gonna come back down their stem aggressively. You're just gonna see them almost pattering their feet. The difference is gonna be for the number two receiver, he has wrap responsibilities off of the number three defender. So if that will linebacker in this case, tries to wall off aggressively to get underneath, so if they're playing cut coverage and the will is trying to wall off aggressively to get under that number two defender, our number uh, two receiver, I beg your pardon, our number two receiver will wrap right in behind him in that void between uh, that now will linebacker and where the Mac would have been. So that's smash. Uh, the quarterback's going to read the corner and throw opposite. Um, we don't, you know, we don't talk about secondary reads. What we tell, you know, on the backside, obviously we didn't draw it up because uh, I wanted to put the highlight and emphasis on smash. Uh, oftentimes and almost always we'll run post and go on the outside from two and one. Two is running a post to replace uh, the free safety should he attack uh, aggressively over the top of the ball. Obviously, if they were in a too high look, we'd be running the football, right? Regardless of down and distance. One thing I'm going to tell you guys very, very clearly, I do not coach the down and distance. So I don't tell my guys if it's second and 12, run to 12. We run plays and we attack it, we attack field field zones. I, I don't care if we don't get the first down, right? Like my job is to maximize how many yards we get on every play to give ourselves our best chance. Because second and third and 12 is the worst possible scenario. It's terrible for field zone. And the reality is if we're trying to throw into three on four situations. And now we're extending our routes to things that our guys aren't comfortable getting to and they have a practice. Our chances of success are like 30% anyways. So 70% of the time we're off the field. Now we could run a draw to five man box and pick up 18 yards and do that 30% of the time they're alone. And sometimes we're gonna get, you know, only seven yards on third and eight or second and eight, I beg your pardon. And at least we've given our coach now an opportunity to go for it on third down. So we don't coach to down and distance, we coach the field zones. Uh, I'm sure that frustrates some people, uh, but we've seen a tremendous amount of success from it. Uh, and again, we know the reality of what, you know, I see it all the time. People attack into those, and that's when the interceptions happen, strip sacks, fumbles happen, sacks happen. Nobody gets upset when those things happen, though, when you throw the ball, because that's what's supposed to happen. We see it all the time. We've minimized our sacks. We had at St. Mary's, I think, at, through six weeks of the, uh, of the year that I was there, we only given up four sacks in six games, throwing the ball as much as we did with three true freshmen on, on the offensive line. So we don't give up a lot of sacks because we don't ask our quarterback to sit there and hold it and hold it and hold it. So we've gotten a lot of success and knowledge out of it. So here's, let's look at what the play looks like uh, um, as executed. So one of the things that we talk about always is we attack to the three on three. So in this particular case, uh, there's a few things that going on here that we can talk about. So first of all, it does look like you're gonna get a three on two to the boundary right here, but we also know that somebody's about to walk out because they don't play with Again, you, when you watch enough film, you recognize certain looks and what's about to happen. So uh, one of these two defenders, and they like to split and play games. And the, the reality is, is that it's going to be the opposite of what you think. Uh, I would say the Will linebacker is probably going to add in and, and he's going to drop out. Um, and that's why they're showing a game here right now. They want us to attack boundary. We don't want to attack boundary. The free for us is a boundary defender right now. So, and I, I'm not going to sit here and talk what exactly our rule is on some of these things. 
again, everything is on the internet and there's some stuff that I just don't want other defensive coordinators knowing what our hard and fast rule is on some of this stuff. If you ask me offline, you know, certainly uh, uh, if I know what your, you know, what your role and where you're at, I'm certainly happy to share some of that information with you. Uh, so we're gonna go to the field side based on, oh, sorry, I'll go back to that. We're gonna go back to the field side here uh, based on uh, it being a true three on three. And you can see as the play develops here, look, it's true three on four down here to the bottom of the screen. And to the top of the screen, it's true three on three out there. So for us right now, we're reading the corner post snap. Okay, so as you see the corner sinking. So that's the easy part. We know we're gonna throw the corner. So that's not what today is about though. Today is about talking about the execution of the route. So you're gonna see two six yard hitches. Our number two defender, our number two receiver is looking at the number three defender to see if he's walling off. He's not, he's working with the number three receiver. So he's just gonna sit soft with an inside step or two. Our number three receiver though, I did tell you, we don't run our corners at 10 yards or 12 yards. We run into the depth of the deep third defender. So if that deep third defender, in this case, that's a, the field corner, if he carries vertical uh, all the way with our number three receiver, we'll actually never break to the corner, okay? We'll just keep running vertical. And why that happens is as soon as we break to the corner, that's gonna trigger the corner to look inside and see if the ball's thrown. You can see that the ball is actually halfway to the wide out right now before the corner even realizes that the ball has been thrown. That's because our corner, our number three receiver just continues to carry vertical. And as a deep third defender, he's responsible for him. So he needs to know right now, like, do I need to keep bending down over top of him to take away the seam route? Because that might be a seam. Or is he coming to me, right? So he's waiting, waiting, waiting. Obviously, now we've seen the ball is almost at the sidelines. And it's not until right now that our number three receiver has got to the depth of the corner, which is now at uh, 16 yards, that we actually finally break to the corner. And you can see because of that, we've given our wideout a significant advantage. We've caught the ball out here, and there is nobody within 10 yards of him. So again, we tell them never to go inside. So you'll see him take two hard jab steps to the inside just to set that corner up to try and get his outside shoulder so that we can pick up you know, the additional yardage. So we're never gonna turn inside and try and run inside. The only times we'll actually turn inside in this particular case is to try and create an opportunity for us to get up the sidelines. So in this case, you can see we fall forward for an extra yard or two and we end up with 14 yards on second and 15. So once again, look, we weren't throwing to the yard sticks. We weren't trying to get the first down. We were just trying to execute to the field side zone. We did that. We end up with 14. We went for it and we got it on third down. The next play, it's still smash. I've got it twice here. Not every play do we have twice. Um, but you can see here, um, it's different now. So the last time you could see that the free safety was uh, actually it's the same. He's giving us the field again. So as last time you could see, he was a little bit more I would say for other people it would have been uh, less clear that he was giving field versus boundary. And this one is, is absolutely clear. So I can tell you that somewhere our rule is more than what you saw. Um, but as you can see, it's a true three on three to the field right now. And if I count boundary defenders, it's three on four, right? Uh, the Mac backer really can't support the boundary. He supports the box and he's there to pick off any crossers. But in terms of hitting, getting under a hitch to number three, uh, it would be really tough and aggressive. But if we were running hitches and this is not, the play that we were running, but that's, we would be reading off him on wrap responsibilities. But once again, this is smash. So we're looking at the field side. And again, you're going to see, once again, we run the depth of, uh, of the deep third defender. So, and you can see a restack here. So again, the, this is man coverage. And you can see that this is a third and 10 situation. This is a heartbreaking play. Uh, I hate showing it. I have to relive it every time I show it. Uh, there was 50 seconds to go on this game. It was third and 10. We were ranked 10th in the country and we were two and one. Uh, first time Toronto was ranked in the top 10 in 20 something years. Uh, and this play here, if he catches this ball, uh, we would have won this game and, uh, and probably been up to number eight or seven in the country. Uh, again, it's just smash on third and 10. Again, we're not attacking the sticks, um, but we are reading uh, and obviously getting field zones here. And you can see, even though it's man, you can see the field corner trying to bait us, trying to bait us into throwing that corner and trying to rob it on us, right? He knows obviously that that's where they're deficient. Um, and so we run the route. Now, if we'd run our route at 10 yards, you can see we're on the 41. We'd have been breaking on the uh, 29 yard line. I said, yeah, the 31 yard line, I guess. So it would be 10. If you're 12, you'd be on the 29 yard line. Um, so you could see that obviously there's the 31. Now we're at the 29. We're not even close to getting to the corner yet because we still haven't uh, got to the depth of the deep third defender. The other requirement is obviously that we win. 
So just because we're the depth of that deep third defender doesn't mean we can go to the corner either. We also have to win. So that means restacking. So here's what a restack looks like. This is really well done by Daniel Giordani. It is an absolute shame what happens on this play because Daniel does everything right. Everything right. Right. Here's the restack. Gives himself a two-way go. You can see that Sam linebacker right now is in a position where he's in full chase. We've won. The ball's gone. You know, Clay was able to determine that that corner is in fact playing man. Because if he wasn't, he'd be he'd be dropping aggressively right now once the wide out or once the number three receiver got to his depth. Because he's still trying to bait him. Clay knows right now, let it rip. Uh, Clay's got an unbelievable arm. He's a tremendous quarterback, smart kid. Uh, he throws an absolute dot here. Uh, unfortunately, Daniel just doesn't put the catch in. Uh, but again, you know, we, we uh, you know, everything, look, we want to catch the ball. Um, there's no doubt about it. But, but we, uh, we grade everything uh, based on the process that we put involved. He did everything right. We know the reason why he's there on that field is uh, that position on that field is because he's a guy that absolutely we believe in. And unfortunately, he didn't catch the ball that time. Uh, but obviously, um, you know, we continued to go to him and he had a great game. That game, he actually had 140 yards. That would have been all, almost 200 that game for him. Um, and, and again, you know, had had tremendous catches the rest of the year. Um, you know, it was it was an opportunity to, you know, experience high pressure and it was good for him. Uh, but at the same time, he did everything right. And we're proud of him. And we know that that's how we're going to build sustainable success. The next concept that we're going to look at is over under. So this is going to be a little bit more tricky of a concept because this is actually a full field concept, even though we're only talking about the boundary portion of that, which is the over under part. We also actually push our back to the field side off this and give them a free release where we block the five. So the drop for this is different. It's not actually gun and three anymore. It's catch, rock, step, throw, reset, throw. So if we're going to throw to the back, you're going to see it's catch, rock, step, throw to the back. And then it's, if the Sam uh, does not give leverage on the backup when we push them to the flat, it tells us to immediately high low the Mac linebacker. So in that particular case, you know, it would be reset and throw. And we're high lowing the Mac between the Y and the W. It's that simple. Um, the running back is going to free release to the field flat uh, at two to four yards. Our number two and number three are going to spike release. And that means that they're going to come together. Uh, the number three is going to set the place at which they should spike. And the number two is going to waggle over to him. Uh, we don't run motion. So if you watch our, 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 our games, uh, it's not to say we won't ever. And in the red zone, we certainly will. Uh, but when we're in between our own goal line and their 25 yard line, you won't see motion from us uh, because it clouds the quarterback's rules and reads. We need the 20 seconds to determine what we need to run based on the defensive alignment. Uh, and by motioning, we're just creating cloudiness for ourselves. So it doesn't make sense. Um, so in this particular case, the number three is going to run a 10 yard, 10 to 12 yard in, and he's going to inside release, even though he's kind of waggling outside there, he's still going to post up inside release off the number three defender, the Sam or the Will, Sam if he's rotated over. And the number two is going to come underneath him at two to four yards climbing. Uh, or four to five yards, I think, pardon, climbing. Uh, our boundary uh, wideout is going to run a 14 to 16 yard dig. Our quarterback is going to peak the Sam on the on the snap. If he gives up leverage, we're immediately going to take the back and the flat. And I think we did that, I think, uh, in the first quarter against Waterloo for about 150 yards on five catches. And then they finally just said, okay, we're not giving the back up anymore. And we started throwing high low. I think that's what this clip is, but I'm not sure. Uh, we'll look at it. So you can see the back is free releasing here and you can see 37 aggressively chasing him out there, right? So we're, we're peaking 37 right now. Does he give up leverage? Not really, no. Like he's right on the hip of the, the defender. Sometimes you'll see the, the backer drop straight back or just let him free release. You can see our number two and number one receivers to the field and we didn't talk about it on the picture because I was just talking about the over-under portion, but they both have outside release goes and you can see two wrapping aggressively. So if if, 37 had given leverage up on 87 right now, the, the back coming out of the flat, uh, we would go to throw to him. But if it gets cloudy from the outside, when we throw to him and the half's there, it tells us to go outside. So cloudy from the outside, go outside and throw to that wrapping receiver who'd be wide open right now, as you can see. Uh, but in this case, 37 didn't give up leverage. So now we're high lowing uh, number eight, I think is his number there, um, who's jumping down on the shallow cross on 88, right? As he comes right there. So that tells us to throw the deep dig to 81 as he's coming across. Now, 81 does not do a very good job here. You can see he's drifting. So he should be sticking his foot in the ground right now at 10 to 12. 
So he's 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 stepping in the right direction at 10. Uh, but you can see he drifts to 13, 14. Obviously, he gets the catch. You know, we make a big play here. We get 14, 15 yards. But if he had snapped this off, stuck his foot in the ground, he might get in the end zone. Now it's hard for me to be super critical of Nolan. Nolan was second in the in the country in receiving and first in the country in touchdown yards or touchdown catches. But again, this was an opportunity, maybe even to get to the end zone here, just by doing the little things right, right? So again, snapping this route off, being flat to the line of scrimmage, working back almost to the ball, and not drifting towards that free safety and giving them a free tackle. Make them earn their tackles. That's what we try and do. Uh, I'll show you the tight of that film. Uh, I think there's some value in it because you can see what 37 not giving leverage up on the back. Sorry, I said 87 on the back earlier, it was 83. But you can see he peels out of there in a hurry. That's him not giving up leverage. Okay, that's him not giving up leverage. And you can see here, uh, I don't know if that's eight or zero, the backer right there that we're reading off of. He jumps down here on, on the shallow cross and you can see the deep dig opening wide open for, for Clay. Uh, the next play that we're gonna talk about is all verts. Uh, all verts is a concept uh, that we do run quite a bit. Uh, I know a lot of people are familiar with it. You see it in the CFL all the time, university all the time. Uh, so the, 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 this, this drop for the quarterback is catch, rock, step, throw again. So the same as the last play, we want to throw those seam routes on that first step, catch, rock, step, throw. Or we want to hit that field, that, that, that uh, number two seam, if that's where we're throwing it to, somewhere in between 18 and 20 to 22 yards uh, on that. Our number one receiver is reading the number two defender. So if the number two defender sinks with the number two receiver, he's going to replace him with a dig. When I say sinks, I mean runs with him or plays field cut or boundary cut over top of him. Uh, and then we'll, re we'll, we'll replace him with a dig. If um, the uh, number two defender jams and releases, uh, you know, plays hold or cover four, we're going to run a fallout. So we're just not going to run into traffic, basically. So our eyes are on, the, on number two, and whatever he does, he can't be right. So he's putting the quarterback into a good situation off that throw because the quarterback's reading off of the free safety. So the number three receiver, the Y who's diagrammed here, his job is to get across the free safety's face as quickly as possible. If that means he has to go underneath the backer, so be it. Okay, but he's got to get across the free space because that's where we're making the decision and we're making the decision very, very early. Um, so from there, uh, quarterback catch rock step throw. If the free goes, let's say to the field side or to the, in this case, the field side. So taking the crossing vertical, we're going to throw the, um, the boundary side seam. Now, we're not going to throw it against man. We're not going to throw it, and I'll talk to you about why, because, it's, again, it's a completion percentage thing. Um, so basically, if it gets cloudy, if the throw gets cloudy from the bottom, we go to the bottom and throw the dig. So if the half is responsible for making the throw cloudy, either by playing man or by playing cut, we're going to replace them and throw dig. The reason why we don't want to throw seam um, against, uh, and again, you can hit it. I'm not, I'm not denying, and I know lots of teams have, and lots of teams have thrown touchdown on seam to number two, but I, I, want, you, I want to pose this question to you. If the will linebacker is running with, or the Sam rotated, uh, is running with the Y receiver, and the boundary half is running with the number two receiver, then there's nobody underneath the dig until the Mac linebacker. So we really like our chances of completing that dig. In fact, when we've charted it, we complete 87% of our, our dig routes. Uh, that, that hit our receiver. Uh, when we throw the seam route though, we complete 42% of them across multiple teams. And that's not just our teams, that's multiple teams. So I would rather take the guaranteed or close to guaranteed completion with a chance for yards after catch, because there's nobody there to assist the corner in making the tackle, than a 42% completion where I'm either off the field because it was second down, or I'm into second and 10 situation where I have a, a limited chance of of picking up a first down, right? The reason why we don't have to attack down a distance is because we don't put ourselves in a lot of really bad situations anyways. We try and you know maximize. And that doesn't mean that we don't make big plays, we do. We just wanna make sure that we're not forcing the ball down the field. And again, like, you know, nobody's ever gonna second guess you for throwing that scene. It's just, if I tell you that you complete 42% of them and when you go back and look at it, and you're gonna be somewhere in that neighborhood, I promise, if you, if you throw it enough, um, you're gonna sit there and be like, wait, do I really wanna be completing 42% of my passes? The answer is probably not. So here's a, a version of us running uh, all verts against, uh, again, Waterloo uh, from week one of the season. Uh, you can see there's a couple things that we do well and a couple things we don't do well in this play. So let's have a look. So the first thing is our number three receiver is trying to get across the free safety space. 
he does not do a good job. He obviously gets a good, does a good job of getting across the will space, um, but what he does not do is continue to get across, and you'll see it on the tight. You know, he, he starts off on a good angle and then just kind of gives up. Look, if we throw the boundary side seam here, uh, we probably would have got tackled from behind by the free safety, because essentially by not getting across his face, we didn't take him out of the play. Um, so we're fortunate that, you know, well, I mean, look, I would have I loved to have had a 60-yard completion here versus the 20 we did have. But again, if we had just attacked the free safety, we'd have been even better. Our number two receiver here uh, does a really good job of taking an inside release. And you can see him triggering 44 to try and get hands on and take a hard step with him, uh, even though he's not running with him. He's like, uh oh, I don't want to give up the inside release because my buddy might get burnt down the seam. So he's trying to do something to force him to go a little further inside or come back outside or slow him down. And you can see 30, who's a very good player, Terrell Ford, bending down over the top of the route to try and take that seam away. So you can see for the quarterback here, and his steps are catch, rock, step, throw. Okay. Uh, although it looks like he does a little bit more of a kind of pros off. Again, this was week one. Uh, there was definitely room for growth here, but we want catch, rock, step, throw. And then it should be reset, throw, or reset, step up hard as he does, and then throw. So in this particular case, the free tells us to throw to the, the boundary side here because uh, we never actually even get to them, so we should be throwing here, which tells us to throw to the number two receiver up to the seam. In this particular case, it gets cloudy from the outside, right? So we go to throw that seam and we see the corner like staring us right down the barrel. So cloudy from the outside, go outside and throw the, the field side follow or the boundary side follow, which we do. So that works excellently for us. So you go catch rock, step, throw, recep, step up, throw. So that's all birds. And the last one we're gonna talk about today uh, before we do one quick RPO, we're almost done, I promise, uh, is, is flood. So flood is again, catch rock, step, throw, reset, throw for the steps. Uh, and we're, we're reading between the Y and the W on the shallow out at two to four yards and the deep out at 10 to 12 yards. The outside release go comes from the boundary receiver. We'll only ever throw that against press coverage with no help. Okay, so we want the only time we ever want to throw it again, we have a better angle on throwing the outside release go against press coverage against the corner than we do to the field side seam. It's still not my favorite, but uh, they are putting a corner on an island there with no help over the top of the ball. So that's the only time we'll take that throw. Otherwise, he's just running the top off the route and we're stretching the boundary half if we're running the boundary or the field half if we're running the field. Uh, number two and number three, once again, are running a spike release. Once again, this time the number uh, three. Or sorry, but the number, uh, yeah, the number three is setting where he's starting. The number two is going to work to him and set the natural rub off of the number three defender. And then the Y, the number three receiver, is going to push to the flat where we stretch uh, the boundary half. Uh, so here's how that looks. And you can see it's going to go to the boundary here. And you can see the number two defender in this particular case jumps, uh, sinks for about two to three steps with the number two defender. You can see. Our number one receiver here is getting pressed and gets walled off right out of bounds. Look, he should have tightened his split down by being so wide to the sideline right now. It's easy for him to get pushed out of bounds. But because he's doing the right thing and taking that outside release, he basically takes the corner out of the play and we're able to throw it on the quick out right now. As you see, obviously now we're able to turn it up and we pick up on first down eight solid yards. So we've got a second and two. Look, our job is to average 6.8 yards per play. That's our goal as a minimum. That's our, that, that is the, the bare minimum of what success looks like. So at eight yards, that's not too bad. I did promise I have a little bit of RPO stuff to look at. So I'm going to quickly get to that. Uh, as you can see, so this is kind of a, a cool setup here. Uh, this is a drill on the inside. And I know it's small, but if you can take a quick peek, this is a drill that we run in practice. So it's the RPO that we have. You can see we have one receiver set up, okay, with one, two box defenders. We have a center to snap the ball, a quarterback and a tailback, and then an inside receiver. That inside receiver is going to read the field side or the, the, the opposite side back backer. You're going to see in some cases we run inside zone to the field or outside, or sorry, inside zone to the field or outside zone to the boundary. In either case, we're RPOing the boundary side backer. Okay, so we're going to be reading off the boundary side backer as quarterbacks and tailbacks. So the tailback is also responsible for the boundary side backer. So if the if the boundary side backer blitzes, We'll abandon the fake altogether. The, the tailback will fall off and he'll be responsible for the boundary side backer and blitz. The quarterback uh, is, is then just throwing the ball to our receiver who's reading the field side backer. So if that field side backer just sits or plays run, he's just going to sit down on a hitch rip. If that field side backer blitzes or tries to wall off aggressively 
on getting underneath that receiver. He's going to wrap it uh, into that vacated zone. Uh, and hopefully we're going to get a really big play out of it. So I've got a few uh, practice demonstrations of this drill because I told you we we, we uh, factor our, our, uh, our practices into the actual plays that we run. So this is what an indie period would look like for us. And this was actually taken at York. So this is the first actual film of York I've showed you uh, uh, with some of our very young players uh, inside of pods. So this was the pod training that we were able to do back in December uh, while we were still able to get on the field. Uh, and the last play that you're gonna see the fourth clip uh, in a row is gonna be actual RPO, the exact same drill that we ran put into a game again against Waterloo uh, where we run the RPO and you'll see how the play translates to the drills. So let's get uh, to it. So the first one here, you're gonna see outside zone to the boundary where we are reading off of as quarterbacks, this defender right in behind Nick said. So this is a freshman quarterback, uh, Nicholas to Jesus. He was a big recruit for us. I really like Nick. Uh, he's one of uh, three or four quarterbacks that will be competing for the job at York. Uh, we have a veteran back, uh, Noah, who's got a really uh, a great skill set, and we got a couple other young players, uh, Brady and, and and a couple more recruits, and Elijah, uh, that are, they're going to compete hard for the job. So, uh, what you can see here is Nick right here is going to be reading off this backer, this receiver who's just out of frame right now is going to be reading this receiver, or this defender. Uh, the O line is really just there just to go through steps, and sometimes they actually get in the way and block the wrong guy only because there's no front in front of them to actually block. But you'll see. So you can see in this case, the backer steps down. We're running outside zone to the boundary right now. So just like if we were running inside zone to the field, either way, we're RPOing off that defender. So that back is now responsible for, in this particular case, he's responsible for that backer who's got his hands up right now. So you can see how he's running through his outside shoulder. The quarterback is trusting the receiver to put him in the positive situation. And you can see right now, as he's sitting into this route, the number three receiver, because we're in 23, is, has eyes on that number two defender. You can see him peeking him right now. As he sits down, it looks like he's running hitch, but because he's getting walled off, there he goes into the wrap. And you can see we throw right in behind his head. And this should turn into a really big play because now there is nobody in the box to make this tackle. And the free safety is going to be sinking. So it's going to turn into the free safety at depth, one-on-one -on -one with one of our most athletic receivers. So that's what it looks like. Now I'm going to play it out for you in real time just so you guys can get a look at it. And you can see, you can probably hear the audio. Our quarterbacks are responsible for everything. I don't even put them in this drill. They have their choice of inside. Oh, outside. Hey, so the next drill, and we've got a couple different camera angles of the same drill. It's the exact same drill. This time it looks like instead of running outside zone, it looks like we're going to run inside zone. So you can see because we're obviously to the boundary right now. And we could run an RPO. You know, look, if, the, if if they gave us the field, we would RPO the other way. So we'd be RPOing the other backer. And then we could run inside and outside zone. So there's no way, the great thing about us running inside and outside zone at both backers is there's no way that that's ever going to tip off what we're running or that we're running RPO. So once again, you're going to get the same look here. Uh, backer steps down. Uh, and then the other backer with a delayed blitz. Obviously, we could have wrapped here because if it was a delayed blitz. But at the same time, he just he thought that the blitz happened much later. So he just sits down, which is also fine. Um, but you can see, obviously, in this case, the quarterback is quickly abandoning the fake. You can see he's getting off of it earlier because he sees that that boundary side backer is stepping down and absolutely playing run. So you can see Nick uh, does a good job extending ball and then doesn't read right all the way through because he doesn't need to. So now he just sets and resets himself and is ready to throw the football. And I'll play it out in real speed again. The next clip will be one more with a different camera angle again. So this time it's going to be outside zone again because we're always attacking boundary. We only have one receiver up, so it's clear we're attacking boundary. So again, uh, in this particular case, we're reading off this backer and we're, we're working to this backer with this receiver. So again, I'll just play it through slowly. You can see he blitzes here. So we get into a situation. And, and again, it turns into wrap. The receiver sees it just a little late and you can see he doesn't peak until now. He's got to peak a little earlier. So he should have sat it down a little earlier. And because of that, it forces Nick just to hesitate a quick second. But this is a pretty good ball, all things considered, uh, to put us in a really positive situation off the wrap rate. And again, we'll play it for you in real, real time.
finally, what it looks like in an actual game. So here's a rep of us running into Toronto. Again, I wish I could show you your clip, but I haven't coached a game at York, even though I've been employed for a year. Uh, so right now, look, they're giving us, uh, you can see right here, two on almost four right here. We're three on three to the boundary. Uh, so we're going to be RPOing this defender here. Receiver is going to be reading off this defender here. It's the exact same drill that we just ran. Okay, and I'll show it as it plays out. You can see right now that the backer steps down aggressively. Uh, no blitz coming, and the backer is not walling off the number three receiver. So should we just be throwing it immediately to the hitch to three, just like it was on that drill? Our receivers are always going to turn outside because we don't want to turn inside. There's no help with backers all in there. So we want to turn outside and pick up blocks as we go. And lastly, I'll play this one through in real time. It's got a happy ending. And we'll just watch it very quickly from the tight. You'll see the same thing. 38 is the RPO defender. Eight or zero or whatever number he is over on the right side is the backer that the receiver would be reading. You can see he said soft. The backer stepped down, took himself out of the play. We turn outside. Receivers are all turning back to pick up blocks. 12 does a good job of turning his back so that he doesn't get a block, a block in the back call. We teach that too. When you're working backside to pick up a block uh, to somebody that can't see you coming, work to them get in front of them and then turn your back so they run through you, but you didn't block them and you can't get called for penalty. That's it for me, guys. Uh, I, I, I'm excited to get to your questions if you have any. I know I went a little bit longer than I'd anticipated, by about nine minutes, but uh, uh, some pretty good information there and some fun information to present. I uh, really enjoyed it. So I'll, uh, I'll turn the, the presentation off, open it up and uh, look to see if you guys have any questions.